We have a lot to talk about today. We had the debate last week that is really starting to create a narrative in the space. We have altcoins that are finally starting to find a bottom, Bitcoin at the bottom of the range, potentially ready to break out. Stay tuned. All right, guys, let's just jump straight into this. I want to start off with this chart that is showing you really what is going on with the Bitcoin miners. If we see, if you look here, and let me move me around a little bit, you can see that the hash rate of Bitcoin, if you don't know what that is, the Bitcoin network, the security being uh, created is by the miners. Okay, They're securing the network, and they are competing with each other to earn Bitcoin. And you can measure how much they are contributing to the network in, in what is called hash rate. And when this hash rate is dropping, what that is indicating is that miners are, are basically going out of business. And we see during the FTX bottom, this was the absolute bottom at 15K, we had a huge drop in hash rate. And we're starting to see that here. And I think that's kind of interesting because what a lot of people don't know about the last quarter, and we just ended the quarter as I'm fi uh, filming this right now, there was a unique set of circumstances that led to the heaviness and the drawdown that we saw. And it started with miners. Okay, why did this happen? And I really want people to understand this. These miners are not just earning Bitcoin and holding it forever. Why? Because they're a business and they need to pay for electricity to run their mining operation. So we typically get selling after the halving. Why? Because their profits are cut in half right immediately after the halving, okay? Assuming price is not going up. And this is really, really important for people to understand because this is ultimately what kicked it, what really prevented us from breaking out to the upside. And why I'm mentioning this first is because I think there's a pretty good chance that we have seen the end of minor selling. We're gonna go into some other sellers, the US government, German government, and Mt. Gox in a minute, but I really want to articulate how important this is. We can see here from this report here, on this headline, that we're seeing a major shift. This is a very important headline because what this is showing you is that there are mining companies, uh, Core Scientific in particular, and there are some other ones, that are now getting into the AI game. So they have all this computing power that they're using to secure the Bitcoin network, and they're now starting to sell some of that out to these AI-hungry companies that need compute to, to operate. The reason why I'm sharing this is I think this contributed to some of the selling. Why? Because at baseline, or at, at you know before they got this deal set up, they didn't have the infrastructure to, you know, to power these AI models like without buying things in addition to, to what they have, meaning they need to at least buy some other sort of, uh, you know, chips or something that will allow you know, their operation to be compatible with these AI models. Why am I mentioning this? Because that just adds a whole nother layer of selling that we actually probably wouldn't have seen if it wasn't for these companies starting to divest into AI. Why is that important? Well, now they have an extra source of revenue. So this is actually really, really bullish for miners and for less selling pressure in the future. Why? Well, they probably won't have to sell as much because they have two sources of income. They're generating income from AI, and you know if the price of Bitcoin isn't going up, or if there's some problems, you know, with the price in general, they can still have this other source of income that can help them not sell. <laughs> okay, so this is really important to understand. And now that some of these, you know, miners are going to be doing this, not all of them are doing this, but some of them will be doing this. They're definitely not going to sell now, in my opinion. They, I think they've already sold. Is really what I'm getting at. They have more more of an incentive now to not sell when you really think about it logically, assuming that they actually are getting these deals set up and they have this other source of income. Miners don't want to sell. This is what people don't understand. They have to sell. Okay, there's a big difference there. If they don't have to sell, they won't. They really, these miners are hardcore Bitcoiners. They believe in technology. They believe that Bitcoin is going to a million like a true Bitcoiner would, okay? So this is really critical for people to understand that. The mining selling was really what prevented us, in my opinion, from breaking out because they started selling towards the top when it was pretty clear that the FOMC was, or they started selling way before the FOMC, but I think you started to see it accelerate at that time because they're like, hey, 
you know, we got to run a business here. You know, let's take some off the table. Now that we got that out of the way and to conclude with, to conclude with the mining thing here, I think they're done. I mean, you're at, you're at ridiculous levels of miner reserves at like all time lows, 14 year lows for the amount of Bitcoin that miners are holding, which is indicating that they've sold a lot. They don't have infinite Bitcoin that they, you know, they don't want to sell Bitcoin, number one. And at some point, you know, they're just not going to be selling anymore because they've, they've already sold enough to run their operations. We're probably there. Miners in aggregate have sold about $2 billion from my, uh, the data that I've seen over the last few months. Okay, Not going to spend too much time there, but again, if you do not understand that, none of this price action is going to make sense. That was the start of the pullback. Okay, What happened after that was we started to get FUD Okay, right in here about the German government, so, somewhere in here, about the German government transferring Bitcoin to exchanges to sell. So that started to create some selling pressure. And then right here, somewhere in here, is when the Mt. Gox headline came out. And then we got the US government also selling Bitcoin somewhere in here as well. Why am I like painting this picture to, for you right now? This is how bottoms are created, is when you have multiple FUD events that push you down to where levels where people want to buy, Everybody's already sold that really wants to sell now is what I'm trying to get at. If, if you didn't sell in here, you're not likely to want to really sell down here if you're still bullish on Bitcoin, if you don't have to sell. Now, that doesn't mean we can't make a new low, but I really think that this is the textbook bottom. It reminds me a lot of the bottom that we had last summer. Okay, Last summer, it was very, very similar. Notice push up, push up push down, retest, you know, to create a bottom, back up, back up, and then back down. It's literally the same thing, okay? It, it's a range, okay? And this is an accumulation range. This is not a distribution range, much like this was not a di distribution range. This was just accumulation before the next leg. And I believe that, that is where we are now. And if you look at this from a quarter to quarter basis, the quarterly chart, this is ex extremely bullish. And you can see that in Bitcoin, in bull markets, Bitcoin doesn't pull back multiple quarters in a row in the bull market very often. You can see that this was the 2015 to 2017 rally. You had a couple of quarters that, that were that were red, but they weren't really you know significantly down quarters. And you can see that you didn't even really have one at all once you got you know once you started to get momentum last cycle. And this cycle reminds me of the, of the 2017 cycle. I, I think that is where we are where we're probably right here. This is probably where we are right here. And you can see this was in July. It's not a coincidence, guys, how this is playing out. And it's not necessarily because of the halving, that's a big part of it, but it's really about a global liquidity cycle, which we talk about in the Discord. There's a link at the bottom of the video. Jump in if you wanna learn really what I think is the true driver of Bitcoin. It's a whole nother rabbit hole to go down. Let's just talk about the charts here, the simple stuff. I'm bullish, obviously, but let's just talk about some levels here, okay? Clearly, if Bitcoin was to lose this level here, you have quarterly support around 47. Okay, this is on the this is on a quarterly chart here. So this would be sort of like I don't want to say the worst case scenario, but let's just say that we had something happen, some kind of black swan, just something unexpected that the market's not hedged for. This is about a 20% drop from here. Okay, so people would they definitely would want to uh, be cognizant that this can happen. This is reasonable. I don't think that actually happens, but I just want to put this out there for people that you want to look at this as mul at multiple perspectives. Okay, if we zoom in a little bit more, let's look at this on the weekly chart. We can see that you have a little bit of support here, which is about 52. This is where a lot of people think that we're going to go or think that we should have gone to. A lot of people had been expecting for us to hit the lower 50s. We haven't yet. Okay, and the fact that we had all of this crazy selling from governments, Mt. Gox, miners, and this is where you are, tells me that you're very unlikely to get here unless we have something very unexpected, some exogenous force, probably I would say in sept September when liquidity is typically very uh, thin anyway and people are very cautious in September to begin with. Maybe we could get there. I just do not see it happening right now. My personal opinion. Okay, now if we lose this, lose this level, obviously, that's in play. If we look at this on the daily, this is really what I think it's most appropriate to look at this right now. We're above the 200 day moving average and we're coming right back up to the most important level on the chart. If you're in the Discord, you know 64K is very important. And there happens to be this volume gap here. 
This is where I think we're going to go. I'm not so sure that we break it on the first try, but I think this is where we will go. We might end up coming back down at some point, but it's going to be very important to see what the order flow looks like, what the ETF inflows look like as we get to this gap, which I, I think is significantly likely to happen at this point in time. So very bullish, like I said, on Bitcoin. I think we're going to break out to the upside probably before um, the election, and I'm going to go into why. This is poly market. This is not my opinion. This is not a political YouTube channel. You guys know that. Uh, I Look, I don't care who you like. We're just going to talk about what we saw in the debate. I think it's pretty clear that people do not believe that Biden will win the election. This is poly market. This is about as accurate as you can get, in my opinion, in terms of predictive markets. This is a predicting site where people bet on the future. And if you really want to see predictive modeling at its best, it's when people put money on it. Go look at the Vegas odds, and it's crazy how they meet so many spreads. It's just, it's crazy. You watch a football game, it'll be the craziest thing ever, triple overtime, but the spread, you know, Vegas had the spread predicted, right? It, it's wild, but it's data. And people are going to put money on what they think is going to happen. People are putting money on Donald Trump right here, so much to the point where I don't even think you can make much money betting on him. <laughs> but this is where we're at. Why am I mentioning this? Because crypto will go nuts the closer we get to this being realized. If he wins, crypto is going to go bonkers. And I think if we're going into the election and these numbers look the same, it's going to go ahead and start pricing this in. <laughs> I don't think it's going to wait. This is why I think we will break out before the election. Now, a lot can change. You could have you know, Biden drop out or whatever. I'm not an expert on the, the politics here, guys. I'm just giving you my opinion. Like I said, these numbers are, I mean, historic. But as of right now, crypto has a lot to price in if this is accurate, because this would totally change the regulatory situation in the United States when it comes to crypto. And a lot of people would want to deploy capital, I think. Let's talk about some other opportunities here. So we know Ethereum is an amazing opportunity because of the ETF. We've been, I've been talking about this very vocally, that this is not priced correctly, given that the ETF, the Bitcoin ETF, was the most successful ETF ever in the time that it has been out. There's been more inflows in it per period of time than any other ETF after launch. It makes sense that ETH is probably going to be the second best or maybe even better, but probably I would say the second best given the seasonality component where Bitcoin launches the ETF at a seasonally more bullish time. Although this is not the worst time, the, the first two weeks of July are actually the most bullish on average two weeks for stocks over the last nine years. So maybe we talked about that in the last video, maybe that ends up playing out for crypto. But just let's just look at this from a chart here, okay? We have an ETF that's going to be live next week or the week after. You just came back to this 100-day moving average. You're finding support. I, this is how I think this plays out, guys. And obviously, look, I, look TA is it, it's, it's a risk management tool. But if I was just going to look at this objectively from a pure TA standpoint, this looks like this is probably going to head back up to these to the highs here. And maybe, maybe we come back down at some point. But, I mean, this is what I think happens. Um, maybe not in this time frame, but I think as we get closer to the election, like maybe this is in August or maybe November, right? But this is what I think ends up happening. It, you'll probably find some sellers, you, you know, with the ETH or with the Bitcoin ETF, you had the Grayscale Trust that people were dumping that and, you know, maybe they were buying BlackRock IBIT after that, or maybe they were just completely leaving Bitcoin markets in general, but you saw a lot of outflows, okay? That's what I'm trying to get at. You'll probably see the same thing with the Grayscale ETH Trust. Some people have been locked in that, trying to get out for a while probably, and uh, because there's been a, a big arbitrage difference between the actual price of ETH and the, the, the Grayscale Trust, which has been lower. Some people might just, as soon as it gets launched as an ETF, get out. So you might see some heavy selling. So I, I don't anticipate that you'll break this high very easily, but considering where we are, um, that's like a 20% move just to get to the local highs this year and much higher to get to the actual high. So this is a very bullish situation for ETH here, has a very nice technical chart. It might take a while to break out, but I think it will. Solana is another one that looks really good here. It actually, I should have, I think it was Vanek or Bitwise is, a, is filing for a spot Solana ETF. We can see that it has bounced off its 200 day moving average. It's now, it's, it's at this 100 day moving average and the 50 day moving average, which are kind of coupled together here. If it can get above this and find support above it, that's a long. And I, I really think that given the market cap of Solana versus Ethereum, this is a no brainer that this is going to be heading back to the highs here. 
and probably much higher as we get further into the cycle, in my opinion, given TradeFi has like no exposure to ETH, but they definitely don't have any exposure to Solana. Very little at all. And it has about an $80 billion market cap last time I checked, or maybe it's like 70, somewhere in there. That is significantly smaller than Ethereum. Ethereum's at like 450 or something. So, or 425, something like that. So I could see this being at least a third of the size of Ethereum at some point. Let's look at some altcoins here. PopCat has been the absolute just juggernaut. I mean, it, so when, when it left the lows, it just has only gone up, hasn't pulled back at all in terms of dailies, daily closes. And now it's basically at all time high. We talked about this a long time ago, or at least a few you know, months ago. Keep your eye on this one. I think it's going to go a lot higher. With these, with these meme coins, I'm not going to do TA on them because, look, there's not enough history on this to really do any kind of serious TA. But if it gets above the high and starts consolidating or something, that might be a good entry. Obviously, you don't want it to be a distribution-looking pattern because that wouldn't be good. What I would like to see is it come back here, which it did come back already. That was really your entry. But if it comes back to this level, let's say it gets rejected, it comes back down to roughly like 0.5-ish, that would be a pretty good entry. Or, you know, even down here. So if Bitcoin were to pull back or something, maybe you would get some, you know, some sort of pullback to this area. That would, this would be the ideal area. I just don't know if that's going to happen if Bitcoin breaks out. Maybe it does. Maybe, maybe people want to sell PopCat to buy Bitcoin. I don't know. Um, but these are the two levels I would look at around, you know, 0.55. And if you lose that level there, you're probably coming somewhere closer to 0.45, you know, to 0.4. But this is one that, again, I don't really recommend people... Uh, be careful, right? There's things very volatile. It's moving a lot intraday. Look at this. The, to me, this is amazing. So if you look at Pepe here, it never lost its 100-day moving average. All the while, while Bitcoin, I mean, just nuked past its 100-day moving average to the 200. Incredible. I mean, it's amazing to me how strong this is. And look at it. It's consolidating above the 50-day moving average. This is not a bearish chart, guys. This is a very bullish chart. I'm not saying that it's not going to come back down. But until you get under the 100-day moving average, this thing is, is very, very bullish. If you look at this thing on a monthly here, I mean, this is kind of a no-brainer that this is a very strong chart here. Keep this on your radar. Pullbacks are for buying on this until it loses structure. And it doesn't look like it, it's going to do that anytime soon. Obviously, things can change if, you know, if Bitcoin stru market structure changes. And then you have like WIF, which is, I think, a, a pretty decent opportunity here. You can see that had a pretty nice bounce off the lows. Here. I'm mentioning memes because these are these are what's going up, guys. I know it may, it may sound really stupid, but these are actually what this is what the market's bidding right now. These are these are really what's hot. I mean, it's up like 40% from the lows. And as you can see, AI, not so much. I mean, look at this. This thing is if we go to the daily here and look at these moving averages below the 200 day moving average, it looks like it might get back above, but you're noticing the difference in strength. Render, which was like a darling of the of the of the you know crypto Twitter at one point. Just got back above his 200-day moving average. Pepe above the 50. The, there, these are just completely different worlds at this point in terms of uh, interest. We're going to talk a lot more about some of these altcoins and our weekly trading plan that we'll be posting in the Discord. You guys should check that out. This is all we're really going to cover in this video today. And until next time, happy hunting, friends. <music>